If I had to use one word to describe gothic, it would be jank. We expected to find nothing but stuffy graves and half-decomposed mummies. Suddenly. I have never played Gothic before. I've had all three games sitting in my library, but I've never really sat down to really play any of them. The only one I maybe touched was three, but I didn't play that much of it either. I actually have most of Piranha Bytes games in my actual Steam library for some reason, and I think it's just because they've always been interesting to me when I look at them, but I've never actually sat down to play them really. Well, one of the things my channel has done for me is give me an excuse to go back and play all these old games and ignore everything else that's coming out. Which is fine, I typically do play older games, it's just I tend to play the same ones over and over. But with this, now I can explore a lot of things I haven't really had the opportunity to explore before, even though I've had interest to do so. So, Gothic was pretty high on my list because I've heard so many good things about it. I basically heard that it's a very underappreciated, underrated RPG series, and it deserves love. And honestly, I believe it. I've heard a lot of good things about it. So, this is my experience with it. Well, from the very beginning, Gothic made a very big statement about how everything's going to go for me because it just wouldn't even run. I kept getting this access error violation, and honestly, no matter what I did, and no matter what I looked up online, I could not get this thing to run. I installed so many different patches. So many different mods, so many different things to try to fix it, and this game just would not run. Eventually, I actually got into the game's main menu, but then, when I would launch the game, it would proceed to access violation. Now, it happened for so long, I worked on this for almost half a day, that I was almost at the point of just giving up on trying to play it. But, see, the thing with me is, whenever something gets in my way, I tend to get this kind of hyper fixation on it, where I just won't let it go until I find a solution. I just can't let these things defeat me. I guess it's maybe like a pride thing at this point, but anytime I run into anything, especially a technical issue, I will literally become so obsessed with trying to fix it that I will not even sleep until it's done. I have been known to stay up all night to try to fix some kind of random technical issue I've run into just because I am determined to figure out what the hell's going on with it and how to fix it. So I did. I persevered. And after half a day spending, what, about six hours trying to get this game to work, I finally found some kind of combination of mods and various fixes to actually get it running. But here's the thing, I'm really not even sure what I did to get it running. I had been throwing so much stuff at the wall that eventually it just kind of worked. It, it just works. And after it started working, I was thinking, well, how am I going to share this with people? Because I normally share how I get these games to work or how the best make them run in the future. And I, I'm going to give you an idea of it, but to be honest with you, I'm not even sure how I got mine working so well. It just works, I guess. So basically what I ended up doing was downloading a thing called Spine, which is like a mod manager for Gothic, but it also will patch up Gothic and also install some basic necessities to get it kind of up and running. But granted, this didn't completely actually fix the game for me. I do also install Union, a four gigabyte fix. Also, I had to go download something called a Gothic Steam fix, but it still didn't quite work even with all that together, but what I did was I installed the Steam Fix and then I did the Spine, and that seemed to have actually let me play the game, because the Steam Fix let me get into the game, and not, but only through the menu. But when I opened up Spine, and then I launched all the mods with it, and then it finally let me into the actual game itself. I'm not even 100% sure this is actually what fixed it, but I also had to go into the Gothic Any file, and I had to set the resolution, but also I had to change it so that the in-game movies that play are going to play at the original resolution because if I try to play them at upscale, they will get an access violation error as well. So between all of that, I was finally able to launch Gothic and get it running. I'm not even 100% sure what I did to fix it, like I said, because I just did all these different things to try to get it running. But hopefully if you follow some of the steps I just outlined, it'll get you up and running as well. So Gothic starts off with an intro movie to introduce you to both the lore and setting of Gothic, but also to explain the events that led up to the actual game itself. 
Now I did download a mod that remastered the intro so I could play it at a higher resolution, but this is the only video I downloaded a mod for, so it would actually work better. Um, the other videos will play at the original resolution, but I mean, there's not much I could do about that because I had to get them fixed. I'm not sure if there's other mods out there to fix them, but at this point, I was tired of trying to add stuff to the game and download more mods just because I had got it working. I didn't want to mess with it any more than I had to. So the setting of Gothic is that orcs and humans are currently at war with each other, and the king needs more resources in order to make more weapons to fight the orcs back. Specifically, he needs a certain type of magic ore, and this ore is basically the most important thing for the war effort right now for the king. So in this king's infinite wisdom, he decides the best way to get this ore is to make a bunch of prisoners do it by forced labor, and then he also erects a barrier around the entire mining colony that is established to basically prevent the prisoners from escaping, but also to prevent anyone from getting in and stealing his ore. This barrier prevents anyone from actually leaving the colony. If anyone tries, or even a living creature for that matter, it'll be struck down by lightning. However, something caused this to go completely wrong. You see, the intention was that the barrier would be controllable, so mages could basically allow people to come and go as they please. At least that's what I understood of it from playing the game. However, it didn't work that way. It killed anyone that tried to leave. The mages, the guards that worked for the king, everyone. And so it was a situation where basically the prisoners weren't trapped in there with the guards. The guards were trapped in there with them. And of course the prisoners took over the camps and killed all the guards and the king's men. Furthermore, because they were trapped inside this barrier, they decided, hey, we're going to start ransoming off this ore to the king. And he's going to have to pay us basically a pretty sum in order for us to keep providing him ore. And that's exactly what they started doing. Now, the interesting thing about the barrier is it does let people into it. It just doesn't let people out. So this is where the game starts off. You see, the barrier will let objects in and out of it because they're not living. And the barrier will also let a person into it. It just won't let people out of it. So this is where the game starts out. You are a prisoner who's being sent to the penal colony. Now, as you're about to be sent to the penal colony, a mage approaches you and says that he needs you to provide this letter to the head of the fire mages when you get into the colony. And so your character agrees because he's promised a reward for doing so. Now this is where Gothic really sets the tone for its actual game. You see, once you arrive in the colony and you get beaten up as a hazing ritual, I guess, you meet up with a man named Diego. And Diego immediately introduces himself and tries to help you out. Now your character politely tries to respond telling him his name. However, before you can tell Diego your name, he tells you he doesn't give a shit about your name. So. There's that. This is actually a running joke throughout the game. Every time your character tries to say his name to somebody, they always tell him they don't give a shit about his name, or they cut him off and just say it doesn't matter what his name is. And I think that's kind of funny, actually. You see, Gothic really does set its tone very quickly. It doesn't take itself too seriously. It has a lot of, you know, campiness and jokes to it, and I appreciate that. It feels kind of like a and d group story. Yeah, there can be a very serious overarching plotline, but there's a lot of silliness in between, which I really appreciate. Speaking of which, there is something I would like to address. The voice acting in the game is, well, it's something. It's definitely not horrible. It just sometimes comes off as very out of place, I guess. Um, it, and of course, I mean, it's not great either, but it's just not like the absolute worst ever either. It's it's just kind of like if you're at a D&D &D table or something and people are doing their funny character voices. That's kind of how it comes off as to me. In, in which he'll contact the sleeper together with the best novices. Hey, you. What do you want? I want to warn you, if you continue this way, you'll be entering our hunting ground. What do you hunt? To be frank, it doesn't really bother me too much. In fact, I thought it was kind of fun. Every time I heard a, hey man, what are you doing, man? I, I just kind of chuckled. I, I, I didn't really find it bad. I just found it funny. I'm well aware that there are people that swear by the German and Polish stubs, and I'm sure they're really good, to be honest with you. I just obviously didn't play it in that, and... I'm okay with playing in English, and I think the presentation on the game itself is mostly fine. Of course, I'm sure there's some people where this is a deal breaker, so if it is, maybe you should do what other people say and maybe play it in a different language and just read subtitles. While we're on the subject, I actually do want to talk more about the sound design. For example, the sound ambience in the game is actually really good. A lot of games back in the day had to really rely on more sound ambience than you know visual because of the lack of graphical fidelity. In fact, instead of describing what it, the game feels like ambience wise, I'm just going to go ahead and play a few clips and let you listen to it yourself.
They also did a very good job of ensuring that the ambience at night feels completely different from the ambience during the day. Gothic has its times where it has a very serene atmosphere, and then other times it has a very almost horror-like eeriness to it. The music is also very nice. A lot of it replays itself, especially when you're in different areas, but I never really got tired of it. It never really got on my nerves because sometimes, you know, when you have the same songs kind of playing over and over, they can get on your nerves pretty easily because you get tired of hearing them, but not with Gothic. They're more so in the background and you have to kind of pay attention sometimes to notice them, but they're they're very serene for the most part. The York Cemetery music is a good example of what I was talking about. You see, it kind of has this very eeriness to it that almost makes you feel like, you know, the shadows themselves are watching you. It just feels very dreadful and at times oppressive that even when you're not in danger and you've killed every single enemy in the area, you still feel like you're in danger. I was looting mummies inside the orc cemetery and I felt that at any moment because of the ambiance and atmosphere that the mummy was going to come alive and grab me. I'll be honest, I really didn't even enjoy looting them even though they had really good loot because it was just so creepy. Never underestimate good sound design because it could really make or break an atmosphere. Speaking of sound design, now I have to give Gothic a bit of an L here. You see, for all the good it does with ambiance, a lot of the creatures just sound strange or downright annoying. One of the worst ones by far is the harpy. The harpy literally has this horrible shriek every time it dies and it is so obnoxious and ear blistering. And I don't know if that was the intention behind it, but it's terrible and I hate to fight him because the simple fact was every time I killed one I was going to have to deal with an ear piercing cry. However, that was probably my main complaint when it came to sound design the game. The other positive to it was the combat itself. A lot of the weapons and everything felt very weighty, which honestly was pretty interesting for a game made when it was because a lot of times I feel like weapons, especially from RPGs back then, felt very floaty because they are focused more on dice rolls, but not gothic. It does a very good job of really making you feel like you're smacking something. I also want to talk about the game world. Gothic is very interesting in the fact that it was made in, what, 2001 is when it came out, so it was probably in development during the late 90s. And the thing is, this game is pretty open world as far as I'm concerned. And this came out, what, the same year that Grand Theft Auto 3 came out? And everyone was very impressed with Grand Theft Auto 3, for good reasons, of course. But honestly, Gothic really takes the cake on this one, because even though it's a small world, in comparison to what you might be used to these days especially, it crams so much into this little tiny space, I guess you could say. I mean, it doesn't feel tiny, I'll say that. But there's just so much crammed into this, and it's like... We play so many open world games these days where it's just a whole bunch of nothing in it. It's just a bunch of empty land, but you know, it's open world, so it's kind of cool, right? But not in Gothic. Every little piece of it is just really well done, and there's just so many hidden nooks and crannies, and I guarantee you, I didn't even find half the secrets that are in the game. Like, let's take a look at Assassin's Creed Valhalla for a brief moment, right? Assassin's Creed Valhalla is a massive world, probably like one of the biggest open world games ever, but it's just very empty. The reason why I couldn't even finish the game was because it was so empty. There just was so much empty land with not much going on with it. Yet, Gothic feels bigger than Assassin's Creed Valhalla, even though it's not even close to being bigger, just because there's so much more crammed into it. So every time you are walking from point A to point B, you have the opportunity to find secrets, find items, stumble upon enemies, all kinds of different things. It's like stakes. It's like... Someone gave you a T-bone steak. It's about two pounds. It's a huge steak, but it's well done and it's not well seasoned and it's tough. Okay, and then someone else gives you an eight ounce New York steak strip, but it's been cooked to medium rare. It has buttery flavor to it. It's got the perfect seasoning of garlic, salt, and pepper, and it's just perfectly juicy and tender. See, even though the other steak is bigger, there's just not much to it it's not really fun to eat it's not enjoyable yet the other one even though it's smaller is much more enjoyable to eat gothic is the eight ounce deliciously perfectly prepared steak sorry for the strange analogy but honestly as a texan it made the most sense to me now in regards to gothic's world and story i would say it's probably its strongest suit honestly and this is the biggest reason to actually revisit and play the game if you haven't ever played it before now from the very beginning the game does establish that there are three colonies in the game there's the old camp, the new camp, and the sect camp. The old camp is the largest and strongest of all the camps. 
They've been around the longest and they have the most influence and power. It's ran by a man named Gomez and him and his men aren't really that concerned with actually leaving the barrier as the other camps are. You see, Gomez and his men are living a life of luxury because they're the ones holding most of the ore ransom and they're the ones that are profiting the most from the king. I mean, they were prisoners before, so why would they want to stop? They're getting everything that they want from the king. If they want the finest foods in the land and the finest wines, they get it. If they want women, they get it. If they want the finest robes of silk, the finest bed sheets, they get it. If they just want money, they also get it. Though they don't really care too much about coin. You see, ore is actually the most important resource in the entire game world. And so people don't actually trade for money, they trade for ore. The more ore nuggets you have, the more rich you are. Now, the new camp are similar to the old camp in the sense they have access to a mine and they also have a lot of ore. But they're not using their ore to actually, you know, live a life of luxury. Most of them are disgruntled people who just want to get the hell out of this place. And so they are going to be using their ore to try to blow a hole into the barrier and knock it out so they can actually leave. They think the old camp is basically a bunch of fools because they're willing to be basically stuck in this place forever, whereas the people in the new camp just want to be free. Now, from the very beginning of the game, you are told by a member of the old camp that the new camp is basically a bunch of rogues and scoundrels who will stab you for your lunch money if you don't give it to them. And while that might be somewhat true, Old Camp is definitely not much better. In fact, most of the bullying I ever got in the game were people from Old Camp, not New Camp. Now the game from the get-go intentionally tries to make you believe New Camp is not the people to be trusted. But in all honesty, if you actually look at how New Camp is, especially as you interact with them more, and the more as the story progresses, you'll learn that the New Camp people are probably the only ones with a good head on their shoulders. And finally, there's the people that live in the swamp, the Sec Camp. The Sec Camp is interesting because they are kind of a middle ground between Old Camp and New Camp. They also want to get out of the barrier, but their way of doing it and what they're trying to actually do isn't really entirely getting out. Rather, it's to serve their god that they believe in, something called the Sleeper. You see, they believe once their Sleeper awakens, then they will be led out of the barrier and into some form of, I guess, spiritual paradise with their god. Out of all the camps, they're probably the most interesting dynamic. You see, on one hand, they seem like a bunch of crazies. They live in a swamp, they all shave their head, and they're all sitting around praying to this mythical god that no one's really ever heard of. But at the same time, they're also pretty chill people. They're very understanding, they're welcoming, you don't really have to worry about getting shivved in their camp. And to top it all off, they'll actually try to teach people that join their camp magic from the very get-go. Oh, and they kind of sit around smoking weed all day as well. This swamp weed that they sell to everyone in the game is pretty funny to me. It's basically how they make a lot of their income. They're literally selling this out to other camps. And a lot of the names for the actual swamp weed is definitely a play on actual real life equivalents of the devil's lettuce, or I guess in this case, sleeper's lettuce. You will have the option to basically join any camp that you want. And once you do that, you will basically be setting up how your character grows. All you have to do though is do a few quests for either camp and then they'll let you in. But for example, if you join the set camp, you'll get magic faster than any other camp. However, that magic will be limited to like only circle four, I believe it is. If you join Oak Camp, you can still become a mage, but it's gonna be in chapter two, and you'll get access to every level of spell that you want. Finally, you can join New Camp, but you won't become a mage until I think like chapter four-ish, so it's pretty late into the game. Uh, ultimately, it's up to you on how you wanna play it, but if you wanna be a mage and get access to all the spells, you pretty much have to choose Old Camp. Now, I was debating on how I was gonna approach this video because I played through all of Gothic and if I was gonna spoil the game, but I decided that the strongest aspect of this game is the story, and I don't wanna spoil it. So if you're someone who hasn't played it, I would prefer that you go play it and experience it yourself rather than letting me tell you about it because it just won't be the same delivery. I will say this, the story is full of plot twists and turns and it's very interesting and it gets interesting pretty quickly and it's never really any time where the story is boring. Now getting to the actual gameplay aspects of itself, I do want to cover first the economy. Now I did mention before that ore is the main kind of currency that you're going to use, but it's not really hard to come by. You see, from the very beginning when you get to old camp, you can basically rob everybody's huts blind. It's not hard to do lock picking. You just need to know the combination and you can safe scum it very easily. And you can make a ton of money from this. You can also just kind of craft a bunch of swords very early on, which you can do by basically robbing the blacksmith and then selling the swords back to him. But 
basically money will never really be a problem as long as you're just constantly picking everything up because there's no inventory limit so you can pick up every single weapon every single item that you find and just sell it back for profit whenever you need it in fact you don't even have to trade or you can just trade the actual items for the things you want and it'll count as long as the value is equal or more. I really like this system because basically it means that I don't really even have to have a bunch of money on hand. I just need to have the items on hand in order to make the money or I could just trade the items for other items, which makes sense in a penal colony. If somebody needs a, let's say, sword and they're willing to give food for it, then hey, might as well trade for that instead of direct money and then turning around to go buy a said sword, right? Now then, I've been kind of avoiding this and I kind of say that for last because of it, because I kind of wanted to cover all the really positive aspects of the game. Now, what I'm about to talk about might upset some people because I don't know if they feel positively about it, but I'm going to say that I don't personally. The combat in this game is just not good. Basically, the game starts out in a situation where a level 1 rat could easily murder you, and that's fine, I understand that's, you know, a typical RPG aspect, but you spend probably the first five to ten levels without any real good armor and basically being unable to survive almost any attacks and you just have to kind of pick enemies off the best you can and you're going to have limited weapons you're going to be basically limited to a sword a one-handed sword and maybe if you're lucky a bow now what normally happens with these type of rpgs is later on your character kind of becomes godlike right you start off so weak a rat can kill you but then later on you're basically taking on god himself right but i mean while gothic kind of has that aspect to it it doesn't really ever make you feel completely powerful and while you might say hey at least there's a challenge to it i would say the challenge is completely wrong kind of challenge to say the least so what's the problem and what's causing it so first things first let's talk about the three combat styles there in the game you can basically be a melee warrior an archer or a mage or some combination of the three you're gonna have to put some points into sword fighting because one it's always gonna be useful and two you're gonna be spending the first couple chapters most likely as a non mage while you can pick up a bow a bow does not get increased damage from dexterity however melee weapons do get increased damage from strength so a lot of creatures early on are not gonna take much damage from your bow attacks but they will take good damage from your weapon attacks but only if you have the strength requirement and I don't mean the strength requirement for the weapon itself even though weapons have that what I mean is you have to have leveled up your strength almost immediately and as soon as you level up a couple of times because if you don't every time you hit an enemy it will take no damage it doesn't matter how much damage your sword does it needs to actually have the strength to go with it in order for you to break through their armor so from the very beginning you need to do two things you have to level up your strength stat to at least probably about 50 and you need to level up your one-handed at least twice in order for you to do any decent damage to any monster in the game but it doesn't stop there you see, another thing is, is that a lot of weapons you get at the very beginning aren't very good. Now, there are some ways to cheese into getting some better weapons. For example, you can pretty much start fights with people and people will not get involved as long as you don't kill someone. So, for example, if you go to the new camp, a lot of them have very powerful maces. If you manage to stunlock someone and kill them, well, or at least knock them out, I should say, you can steal their mace off of them. And that will give you a good damage boost early on. However, you're still going to have the problem of not having any decent armor. You can buy some armor in Chapter 1 before you actually join one of the camps, but you're going to need to work to actually join said camps, and it's going to take some time, and you're going to have to deal with monsters, and you're going to want to grind monsters to level up. But you're going to basically die very quickly to said monsters. So it kind of comes to in the very beginning of the game where you're going to die a lot, and you just kind of have to take encounters slowly and try to pick the monsters off one by one so you can actually get the xp you need and complete your set quests now it does get better especially once you join one of the camps and you start getting access to more skill however like i said it doesn't really get that much better you see you can learn things like magic and you can get better bow skills and you can get better you know weapon skills and even get two-handed weapons but the thing that it comes down to is that most of the game's balance honestly comes from melee combat and not anything else let me explain why so remember when i said strength gives increased melee damage but dexterity does not do the same for ranged weapons so your bows and the damage that they do is basically going to be limited to how powerful of a weapon you can get and the funny thing is, if you get a very powerful bow early on or crossbow, you don't even have to train into it at all and you'll still do good damage with it. 
But the same is not said with swords. You need to basically get enough strength in order to wield it and two, enough strength to break through enemy armor. So that is very important. Now, what about magic? How powerful is that? Well, I play through the game as a mage and magic is weird. Magic sometimes is very powerful and sometimes it's very weak, but for the most part, it just doesn't do what it should do. Basically, for your spells to do good damage, you need some time to build them up and cast a spell. Now, normally when you first initiate combat, you can usually at least get one good spell off, but your enemies are going to rush you down and try to smack you in the face, and every time they smack you, you're going to lose your cast and you're not going to be able to cast that spell. And a lot of the spells in the game, even the quicker ones, don't do a whole lot of damage as you get further into the game. And so you're kind of wanting to use higher level spells to do more damage, but they take forever to cast. And even then, a lot of times they will not kill the enemy outright as fast as just using a melee weapon. So you kind of in this situation where it's just easier, and this is what normally happened to me, to just use my sword to kill things rather than actually using the magic that I learned. And it's pretty sad to see because a lot of the magic spells in the game are pretty cool, but a lot of them just end up being kind of useless in a lot of ways because you just can't cast them fast enough, especially when you have, a, in the later games, a bunch of enemies coming after you at once. You can kind of alleviate it by using summon scrolls, but even then that never worked for me because the enemies did not care about the summons. They always came after me and they ignored my summons even when they're getting smacked by them. I'm sure there's probably mods to maybe fix this a little bit, but I tried to run with as little mods as possible because I wanted the purest experience that I possibly could. So I basically just focused on mods that made the game freaking work for me. But yeah, I, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're going to play it like that, you might as well just go full on warrior because everything else as cool as it can be is never going to probably beat warrior and just being decent with the sword. Now, warriors have their own problems. You see, I do kind of like the system in the game because there's like a combo system that you use. So basically, you hold down your left mouse and then you use W, A, and D and S to use your sword. Now, the thing is that S blocks, but W, A, and D makes you swing your sword in different variations. For example, A and D are going to make you swing it side to side, whereas W is going to make you swing it forward. And if you do certain combinations, as you learn, you'll actually do like combo attacks as you combine these different keys. For example, if you have a one-handed sword and you time your strikes correctly, you can do W, 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 and you'll basically do a whole flourish in a three motion strike, which will kill a lot of enemies if you have a good sword. But here's the thing, if you mess it up even once, you may very well die in the game because you know, you basically screwed up your combo, which kind of stunlocks the enemy, and then they're gonna whack you back and stunlock you. On one hand, I really like this system because I'm a big fighting game player, and I really like the idea of using different combos and keystrokes to come out with different moves. On the other hand, it feels a little clunky in the game to begin with and a little janky, so I feel like it's not that great to honestly use in a game like this. So with all that being said, yes, my opinion on Gothic is that the combat itself is not very fun. And I'm like I said, I'm sure there's mods someone can recommend you to make it better, but in its base format, I don't really like it. Furthermore, in addition to the combat, the gameplay itself is so janky. I can't tell you how many times just walking into an object by accident caused my character to get completely stuck and then crash the game or trying to jump off a mountain resulted in me trying to slide down the mountain, but then I would just, you know, freeze the game again, or maybe just walking into a supposedly closed off area would just cause me to walk through the wall and clip through it, or maybe I would just fall through the ground. So many weird things happen in this game. It's like the game's jank makes it so that you never know what's going to happen. It's so random. Sometimes the jank goes to your benefit though, for example, I've had enemies because their pathing is terrible. They will just go forward to wherever you're at. They don't go around obstacles. They'll just walk off a mountain and sometimes you'll just get XP from them falling to their death, even though they're higher level monsters. Other times I'll run into some kind of weird invisible force field that wasn't supposed to be there because it's like on the trail path and it'll push my character off a cliff and I'll die. So it's just weird and you know, the jank giveth and the jank take if that's basically all I can say when it comes to this game. There is a funny glitch though. If you ever want to get around the game world a bit faster and you basically have to jump off a mountain or something, you can actually use the helicopter technique. Basically pull out your sword, jump off the cliff or platform, and while you're doing that, hold down your left mouse button and the S key and your character will try to block and his animation will continuously reset, making him kind of look like he's doing like a helicopter spin and then he'll just land on the ground safely and never take any damage. 
I thought that was pretty fun. I actually like doing that a lot. But yes, expect to be fighting the game world itself as much as you're fighting enemies because basically you have to walk carefully because if you make the wrong step, the game will go all haywire and will throw everything out of whack. And it's just the nature of things, I guess. Also, there is a ton of escort missions and all those escort missions in the bad AI pathing means you have to really babysit these characters because they will basically fall off cliffs or they'll get stuck on things if you don't pay attention, which is also very terrible. But for all its jank and all the combat issues and all that stuff, I'd still recommend playing Gothic. I still think it's a really fantastic game. And if you look at it from the perspective of 2001, you'll notice that there isn't really RPGs that were like this. This was super ambitious because think about this. This is practically an open world game with multiple choices, big open ended kind of combat and different kinds of opportunities to kind of manage your character. And to top it off, the game also has what is essentially a fully voice acted system, even if it's not that good. It's actually very impressive for a game made back then. And honestly, if you look at the graphics from a 2001 perspective, they're actually really good too. I personally just think that what likely happened with the developers without researching too much is that they are very ambitious for this game and maybe they didn't have quite the budget that they needed for it, but they still came out with something fantastic, and there's a reason why this game is a cult classic. I did really enjoy my time with Gothic, and now I'm very interested in Piranha Bytes overall. I know they recently shut down, but I wanted to kind of play all the other games when I get a chance, and I'm looking forward to Gothic 2 a lot. There is one more thing I want to mention, and this is probably also going to upset a lot of the purists and people that love this game so much and know all the ins and outs. If you are a new player to Gothic and you just want to experience the story and you just want to enjoy it and you don't want to deal with maybe installing a bunch of mods that may or may not affect the core experience and maybe you're just struggling a lot, I have a solution for you. Just use the cheat codes. There's a bunch of them and you can basically give yourself a bunch of um, armor stats and, and skill points and stuff. And yes, it'll trivialize the game, but at the same time, it's worth it if you just want to play through the story. I'm not saying that this is the best way to play it. I'm just one of those people who are like this. If you want to play on a game on the easiest mode with cheat codes because that's how you enjoy it, then that's how you should play it because games are for our own personal enjoyment. Don't let anyone tell you how you should play a game because it doesn't freaking matter. What matters is if you enjoyed it. So I'll just tell you right now, it's very easy to use cheat codes. So if you want to do that and just kind of play the game as like a powerful god, just do it like it's the story is really good and I don't think it's going to change that much for the game because the combat is not that great to begin with and so when you add cheats to the mix it honestly just can make it a little bit more uh, palatable for a newer player. I played through it without the cheats and I played through it a bit with cheats and I'll just say that it didn't really make a difference in my whole experience other than making it easier for me to actually experience the story so to each their own again i know it's going to piss off a lot of people and there's probably already someone furiously typing in chat about how i just ruined their great game by recommending this to somebody but I i'm just going to say it right now the cheats are there for a reason and just have fun with it like that's what games are for i don't see why people have to make everything about how skilled they are it doesn't really matter but that's just me if you like the video and you want to hear more about gothic or you want me to do gothic 2 i'm more than happy to do that i did keep this video spoiler free because i wanted people to experience the story more than anything but if you would like maybe a review on gothic based on the actual story and not me you know just talking about the game mechanics i'm willing to do that as well you guys just let me know let me know what gothic means to you or if you're inspired to play it based on my video Hope you have a good rest of your day and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and help me make more of these videos in the future.